Our next presenter will be taught, the title of her discussion is Reflections from a Muslim Elder in the Pandemic. And I must say that I, I was so excited to see that there that this talk was happening. So often in our community, we soak up an attitude towards elders that is found in the larger community. But we are called to be not only respectful of our elders, but understand that they carry the depth of wisdom that we need. And this particular elder is very advanced in her wisdom and her name is Hajje. And I apologize if I have been mispronouncing and I do hope to be corrected if I do mispronounce. Hajje Ashaki Taha Sise. And she is a Muslim educator and activist, a student of Sheikh Hassan Ali Sise, and an elder and authorized teacher with a Tariqa Tijaniye Sufi order. For almost 30 years, she served as the pro bono executive director of the African American Islamic Institute, an international humanitarian NGO based on the teachings of Islam founded by Sheikh Hassan Sise in Senegal and the main representative of the African American Islamic Institute to the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. During her career as a woman's health advocate and international maternal and child health consultant, she developed and directed programs for women with HIV AIDS, alcohol, and other drug addictions, and worked to establish primary and reproductive health clinics in rural, medically underserved communities in Africa and the Caribbean. Haja Shaki was born in New York City in 1942 and took her shahade in the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood in Harlem in 1969, mashallah. Her political and human rights activism spans five decades within the civil rights, black liberation, anti-war, anti-apartheid, anti-racism, and women's movements. An advocate for greater interreligious respect and understanding, she most recently worked on the development of an Islamic culture of peace and peace building among Muslims and served as a community educator and interfaith facilitator in Greater Boston. She holds a BA from Sarah Lawrence College, an MA in Islamic Studies and Christian Muslim Relations from Hartford Seminary, and continues her pursuit of sacred knowledge with Azhari scholar Sheikh Yasser Fahmi. She was a Muslim Peace Fellow sponsored by the 150 year old peace organization, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And I'm certain that this bio is, it draws short to what we should say about our blessed guest. Thank you so much for being here. And we listen with an open heart and eager ears for your wisdom. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, I am so grateful to Dr. Ingrid Madsen for this opportunity to bring the multidimensional concerns and needs of many elders within the Muslim community to your attention. And I am particularly humbled to be part of this panel moderated by Dr. Tamara Gray. At the outset, I want to acknowledge that although, although this is an academic conference, my presentation is not an academic paper. Rather, it is a personal perspective that includes understandings gleaned from elders with whom I have interacted over time with various, within the various communities uh, of which I have been a part. And while the focus of this conference is the pandemic and its spiritual impact, what I wish to share with you is a broader lens through which to view the needs of Muslim elders and to invite you to widen the lens through which you view spiritual and pastoral care 
to this severely underserved and too often forgotten segment of the Muslim community. I also ask for your indulgence as I read my presentation, as I, like so many elders, find my memory less and less reliable these days. As you know, there are many exhortations in Quran and Hadith that establish the Islamic moral imperative to be kind and respectful to parents. In Surah Al-Isra, Ayat 23 and 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, your Lord has commanded you to worship none but him and that you be kind to your parents. If one or both of them reach old age with you, do not say a word of disrespect or scold them, but say a generous word to them and act humbly to them in mercy. In Surah Al-Nisa, Ayat 36, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, worship Allah and join none with him in worship and do good to parents. In Surah Luqman, Ayat 40, 14 and 15, and we have enjoined on man to be dutiful and good to his parents. Be grateful to me and to your parents, and to me is the final return. In Surah al ankabut Ayah 18, Allah says, and we have enjoined goodness to his parents. Our Habibullah Mustafa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in, a sound, in sound ahadith, those who do not show mercy to our young ones and do not realize the rights of our elders are not from us. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, may he be disgraced, may he be disgraced, may he be disgraced whose parents, one or both, reach old age during his lifetime and he does not reach Jannah by being dutiful to them. And in another hadith, one who is aware of the excellence of old age and respects it, Allah will save him from the terror of judgment. In addition, Imam Ali radiallahu anhu said, the dignity of the old age is dearer to me than the merriment of the youth. And in his Adab al-Mufrad, al-Ashari states, part of respect for Allah is to show respect for the old Muslim. As Muslims, we understand that the loving treatment of our parents that is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, consistently advised by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and held sacred in Islam, is extrapolated to elders in general. Yet the lived reality of too many of our elders does not reflect this shared mandate. Looking at two primary cohorts of Muslim elders in our communities, there is a distinction between those born into Islam from traditionally Islamic countries, typically living with their adult children, and those who embraced Islam in the Western hemisphere, typically living alone, and in many cases with adult children who may not be practicing Muslims and some not Muslim at all. The differing cultural attitudes toward aging and elders within these cohorts could not be more stark. While Islamic societies generally value, respect, and care for their elders, Western societies tend to view elders as a burden to be sent to nursing homes once they can no longer live independently. It is also important not to overlook the reality that even elders who live with their adult children may have many of the same concerns as those who live alone. However, talking about their concerns with their children may not be consistent with their cultural norms and therefore remain unaddressed. Additionally, it would be disingenuous not to acknowledge that elder abuse also exists within the Muslim community. Astaghfirullah. There are many sources of anxiety for Muslim elders, all of which have been exponentially exacerbated by the pandemic. As you will see, these issues span the gamut of physical, mental, financial, psychological, and spiritual concerns. I invite you to begin the essential process of acknowledgement. There is anxiety about physical safety that sometimes takes the form of fear of falling 
especially if one has already fell, fallen. And there's also physical safety issues with regard to elder abuse. There is anxiety because of loneliness and isolation that already existed before the pandemic and has only been exacerbated to the, a great degree. The fear of and dealing with memory loss, physical limitations that impact mobility and functionality, mental limitations resulting from dementia, depression, or other mental illness, separation from family, especially time lost with grandchildren, the lack of agency and sense of autonomy, the inability to perform day-to-day -day responsibilities like house cleaning, laundry, garbage removal, shopping, and basic errands, transportation challenges, such as no longer being able to drive, leading to a sense of increased dependency and fear of using public transportation. Fear of getting sick, whether contracting COVID, having a heart attack or stroke or other non-COVID illnesses and having to be hospitalized at the time of COVID. Worse perhaps is the fear of not being able to be hospitalized because of lack of bed space or to be hospitalized and to contract the illness while in the hospital. There is a great fear of dying alone, fear of rationed COVID case, sorry, fear of rationed COVID care based on age, comorbid, comorbid, start again, age, comorbidities, chance of survival. There's financial insecurity leading to homelessness, fear of it, fear of food insecurity, fear of being put into a nursing home, loss of family and friends and the deep sorrow that accompanies it, sadness over the state of the world their grandchildren will inherit, sadness over the inability to pray in Juma, death-related concerns, specifically the ability to adhere to fifty requirements regarding the washing of the body, the janaza, and the burial. In addition to these sources of anxiety, many Muslim elders are experiencing marginalization, a sense of invisibility as a result of not being sought out, not noticed, not engaged. Despite constituting a rich repository of wisdom born of life experience, education, and professional achievement, the wisdom within our community of elders is routinely overlooked. We don't seek their advice, and although ours is a religion of shura, consultation, we don't consult them. This contributes to fear, feelings of irrelevance, uselessness, and despair. Now that we have a sense of elder concerns, I would like to use this time to offer some suggestions for chaplains. Familiarize yourselves with community and governmental senior services and establish relationships with those agencies. Reach out to senior service organizations to familiarize them with the needs of Muslim elders in medical and assisted living settings regarding things like accommodations for modesty, wudu, salah, dietary needs, and procedures after death. Acquire supplemental training that would ideally include support for geriatric psychological concerns and the spiritual concerns of those who are closer to the end of their lives than the beginning. Training in sensitive, sensitive interviewing techniques will be especially important to be able to probe for and recognize elder abuse. In your interactions with elders, encourage them to memorialize their wishes in writing and assist them in doing so. This in addition to a Muslim will actively advocate for the inclusion of elder needs in verbal and written community assessments. Make sure the needs of Muslim elders are included in conference and webinar agendas and deep appreciation and respect to Dr. Madsen for doing just that. 
recognize barriers to elder participation, whether physical knowledge, whether physical knowledge based or cultural. One of the greatest barriers is a lack of access to and facility with technology. Connect elders with other elders and volunteer opportunities to reduce the sense of isolation, provide peer support, and enable elders to remain active and engaged. Facilitate access to help with bill paying, medication management, help with technology, and make sure that essential utilities like electricity, heat, and phone are connected. Develop community telephone trees to check on elders regularly and mm -hmm. develop referral resources. We know that barriers do exist to effective service provision to elders. On the side of the elders themselves, these barriers include resistance to sharing personal information and an absence of trust. On the side of service providers, the barriers include cultural and langu language deficits between those gathering information and the elders they encounter, absence of culturally competent service providers and services rendered, lack of prioritization of the needs of Muslim elders, and the failure of congregational adaptations to take into consideration elder access and facility with technology or the lack thereof. And here I'd like to um, share my own experience this past Ramadan, which was in many ways superior to previous ones because of the many webinars and classes and opportunities for Sahba via Zoom. Yes, there was sadness that Juma and Tarawi prayers in the masjid were not feasible. And for someone like me who lives alone and whose knowledge of Quran is say limited, um, praying Tarawi alone has serious limitations. And praying the Eid prayer alone felt unnatural. But there was also this beautiful feeling of great intimacy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of increased time for reflection and contemplation, dhikr and dua, and of connection to my immediate and extended community via technology. Nevertheless, I know of many elders in my community who were unable to access these adaptations due to lack of either access to or facility with technology. As a result, their Ramadan felt lonely, isolated, and sad. This technology barrier must be overcome if our community is sincere about serving elders. I am encouraging you to think about effective ways to address this daunting deficit that not only affects the ability of elders to benefit from congregational adaptations, but also affects their ability to benefit from telemedicine and telecounseling during the pandemic when they may fear in-person appointments and home visits due to their vulnerability to the virus. Alhamdulillah, as chaplains, you have a unique opportunity to perform khidmah that will honor and fulfill the Islamic moral imperative to treat elders with respect and compassion and to meet their multi-layered needs with prophetic kindness and love. It is my hope that this anecdotal presentation will inspire the scholars and researchers among you to excavate this topic further and that the practitioners among you will be inspired to take the time required to identify and address the unmet needs of elders within the communities you serve. Thank you so much for giving my reflection your attention. I'm looking forward to a robust discussion. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you for that incredible reminder. And you, you said it, you mentioned at the end that you hoped that this would inspire researchers and community workers to really think about the elder situation in our community. And I want to tell you that in the middle of your speech, I sent a message to my team to say, I had to, with an idea that I have, and how can we, you know, find out how we can do this so that we can start to fulfill 
uh, your call to pay attention to and really uplift the mandate of our religion to care for and respect and include our elders in our community activities.